Thanks, Fiona. Um, well, I guess in this context, my dangerous idea would be that we should not only have a too much medicine campaign, but we should have a campaign against undertreatment because people die of undertreatment as well as dying of overtreatment. And I think, Fiona, if the BMJ is going to have campaigns for too much medicine, I'd really like them to have campaigns about too little medicine um, as well, because there are drugs that would work if they were used, and they don't work if they're not used. Last time we did a sample of all the, ran of all the deaths in India, a random sample of all the deaths, about a tenth of the deaths were people who just died from fever without ever seeing anybody, not even a nurse who could get any idea of what the fever was and no treatment at all. Probably most of those fevers were actually from something curable, cheaply curable. And the same is true in this country. There's lots of drugs that work if they're given and don't work if they're not given. So we need to get evidence as to what works. We need to get evidence of the side effects. But we need to get them given if they do work. And we do need... We need balanced campaigns that campaign against overtreatment and against undertreatment. Um, and that, that, I think, would restore a feeling of objectivity that seems, at the moment, I've, I'm concerned with the BMJ that they're sort of keeping on about the disadvantages of drugs rather than the advantages of them. I speak as somebody who's had his life saved by, treat, by prompt treatment on a couple of occasions already. And from the inside, it's better to be alive. I don't know what it's like from the outside. <laughs> um, OK. Back to what I was going to say. Um, interpretation of large-scale randomised evidence. Well, first, why do we need large-scale randomised evidence? And it's because if you've got some miracle new drug which is supposed to reduce mortality, then the truth is that either it's useless or it's only moderately useful. I mean, there's, you know, the extra possibilities that it's seriously harmful, which is, you know, small but unlikely, but it's happened. It happened with the antiarrhythmics. And it, there's a small possibility that it'll have some spectacularly large effect. But these are small possibilities. The big possibilities are either that it's totally useless or that it's fairly useless. And the job of the trialist, I've spent the last 40 years being a trialist, is to distinguish reliably between whether things are totally useless or fairly useless. And it's okay, it's okay, because if you get enough things that are just some use, um, and the BMJ was very, very helpful with us in getting the first antiplatelet overview um, printed and really presented in detail when nobody else would consider such a thing. Um, and it, it really transformed treatment and got antiplatelet treatment being appropriately widely used. It was back in 1988. Um, then you can add together a lot of small benefits and you can finish up with, a log with big benefits. You know, breast cancer mortality now in this country is only half of what it was 25 years ago. Why? Because there's lots of t small, boring, but real things have been identified, and when you add them all up together, lots of little gains make a 50% reduction in national mortality rates. Okay, now in case I don't get to the end of my talk, or in case I completely muddle up the words, um, everything that I mean to say is in, the fifth is in the fifth edition of the Oxford Textbook of Medicine. Um, the chapter in that is the best thing we ever wrote on trials, trial methodology, trial interpretation, because it's in a big fat book, nobody ever reads it. But anyway, if you do want to know what I meant to say, then it's in there. OK, back to this business of moderate effects. Moderate effects on mortality. I'll give mortality as an end point, but it would do for anything else that's really serious. Um, as, you know, if, it, if the more serious the end point, the more difficult it is to make a huge difference in it. So we're trying to sort out useless or fairly useless. And I'll give you an example. Actually, this isn't a fair example because it's actually brilliantly useful. But there's... There's the 1988, that's aspirin. Aspirin versus nothing in patients who are in the middle of an acute heart attack, acute myocardial infarction. Um, look, people who are looking at their screens in the front row have got to put their screens away. You need to do it further away back in the audience where I can't see you. Um, then, uh, actually, this, is, this would be two moderate effects. If the effect had been only half as good as this, it would have been a moderate effect. And even then, it would have been a beautiful one. So this is, do you give half an aspirin a day when somebody's in the middle of a heart attack? Well, if you do, then 35 days later, you've got 9.4% dead instead of 11.8% dead. 
So that's, that's a nice result. I give it as an example. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's the nicest result we ever had. Um, but I'll pretend it's a typical example. Okay, so suppose we want to pick this up. The reason we got this, the reason we picked it up, is because we randomized about 17,000 patients. You know, with 17,000 patients, you can, you can pick up things like that. And in fact, with 17,000 patients, we could have picked up something a bit smaller than this. Um, but if the effect had been a bit smaller, we would have needed the 17,000. We'd have needed 20,000. But it's okay. I don't mind randomizing 20,000 patients if you can affect the treatment of 20 million patients in the future. But if you are going to pick, look at moderate effects, what are the key requirements? Well, if you're looking for something that isn't very big, you can't afford any biases at all, and you can't afford even moderate random errors. You've got to have very, very small random errors. So what's our list of things that we've got to do to avoid, to avoid moderate biases? So the requirements for reliable assessment of moderate effects We've got to have negligible biases because the difference between useless and fairly useless is not very big. So you can't afford biases if you're trying to accept it. That means you've got to randomise. And what's more, you've got to have small random errors, which means that you've got to randomise big numbers. And what's more, you've got to get all the trials together in the world. How do we avoid moderate bias? Well, first of all, proper randomization. That has been recognised since the 1950s. Non-randomised methods might suffer moderate biases. And, okay, if you're trying to say, does cigarette smoking cause lung cancer, you don't need to randomise because the effect is so big that moderate biases don't matter. You know, you still pick up that nearly all lung cancers are caused by smoking. So you don't, when the effect's big, you don't need to randomise. If you're trying to work out, does penicillin produce wonderful effects on penicillin-sensitive organisms? Yes, it does. And you can see that. I mean, that was demonstrated in Oxford in 1941 by Charles Fletcher, well, and others, but Charles actually gave the injection... And, you know, the infection melted away. They'd never seen anything like it in their lives. They didn't need to randomise to know that was real. So where you've got a big effect, you don't, you don't have to randomise. Lots of medical knowledge is reliable, and it's not based on randomisation. You know, is, is your arm going to set crooked if you don't set it straight? You know, when you, is a broken arm going to set straight or crooked? Well, if you put a splint on it, it'll set straight. Well, you know, doctors knew that without randomisation. There's lots of, you know, th there's a lot of knowledge where the effect is big where you don't need to randomise, where you do need to randomise is where the effect isn't big, and particularly if there's quite a long delay between actually when you do the thing with your treatment and when the effect is observed. You know, if, if you've got to wait a few years till the outcome, then it's very, very difficult to do anything sensible with that randomisation. So, because we're looking for moderate effects, we cannot afford moderate biases, we must have proper randomisation. Analysis by allocated treatment, you can do analysis by actual treatment sometimes, but always the analysis by allocated treatment should be available to readers. Intention to treat analysis. Now, the third one is the one I'm going to talk a lot about. Chief emphasis on the overall results. Um, we don't want unduly data-dependent emphasis on particular subgroups. Now, of course, it might be that treatment does work only in some particular subgroup, and your trial tells you this, but it's it, probably not. Probably if the patient's got into your trial, it'll be working in all of them um, to some extent. It can work to different extents in different subgroups. But the thing is, if you've barely got the power to pick up the overall effect, and you're probably going to need a meta-analysis of all trials to do that, then you really don't have the power to say whether the effect in one subgroup differs from the effect in another. You'd need ten times the numbers. So virtually every subgroup analysis you ever see is rubbish. They are there in every paper. The referees demand them and they are rubbish, they're misleading. Subgroup analyses really kill a lot of people because doctors see them and they think they're real. Okay, it's not that no subgroup is ever true, but most subgroups are not true. And then, again, in order to avoid moderate biases, let's stick all the trials together. That's one reason for putting all the trials together, to get small random errors. Um, and we, we also... Sorry, to, uh, sorry, to avoid biases. So we want to put all the trials together to avoid biases so we don't just choose the trial result we like. This has been recognised now for 30 years or more. And we need small random errors, so we need large numbers in any new trials. And to be really large, trials ought to be simpler. And all of the regulations since the 1990s have just made trials more complicated. The more regulations you put on trials, the more complicated you make the trials, the more you make it so they'll be done only with, you know, 
industry with deep pockets studying patented drugs rather than necessarily the questions we want. And it's, you know, large, simple trials have been almost exterminated by the process of regulation of trials over the last 20 odd years. And then again, for small random areas, you need a systematic overview of all the relevant randomized trials. So all of this comes, we want small random errors, guaranteed avoidance, strict avoidance of any bias, because we're looking for things that aren't very big. Um, and I want to emphasize the need for all the main trial results to avoid undue emphasis on particular studies and to avoid undue, and I want to emphasize this business of avoiding unduly data-dependent emphasis on particular trials or particular subgroups. Okay, so back to the ISIS result. Okay, this is great. So we sent it off actually to the Lancet, not to the BMJ. And um, they accepted it. And the editor said, yes, well, um, we're, we're happy to publish this, but we want you to run lots and lots of subgroup analyses so you can tell us which patients will benefit. And we said, no, this is ridiculous. You're bound to get, I mean, sub subgroup analyses, if you've got a real result, subgroup analyses are a completely reliable way of getting a false negative result in some subgroup. You, if, it, if you've got something that doesn't work, you might get a false positive result in some subgroup. If you've got something that does work, then you will get a false negative result in some subgroup. And we didn't want to do it because it was going to kill people. I mean, th what this says is give people, regardless of whether they're male, female, black, yellow, white, just old, young, give them aspirin when they're having a heart attack and fewer of them are going to be dead a month down the line. And so they said, well, if you don't do it, then we're not going to publish it. And so we said, no, no, it's our own principle. We cannot do this. They said, well, we're not going to publish it. And so we swallowed our principles and said, well, all right then. You know, just, I mean, that's what, well, that's what the refereeing process does. But we sent the programmer out. We told him to buy a newspaper with an, ast with the astro with an astrology column in it, um, you know, Libra, Gemini, Capricorn, and so on. And he came back with the Times. Well, the Times in those days didn't have an astrology column. It does now, but it didn't then. And so we sent him out to get a worse newspaper. And so he came back finally with one that did have a... So we could classify people according to what birth sign they were born under. And of course, with 12 subgroups, it's absolutely easy. You know, you're, you're bound to be able to find some subgroups where treatment appears miraculously effective. In fact, if you're born under Capricorn, as aspirin halved your risk of death. But if you were born under Libra or Gemini, it did nothing. So there you are, Libra or Gemini. You know, we've 3,000 pa patients, 150 deaths first, 100, 150 with the aspirin. Well, look at that. That's dangerous. We're not going to give that to people who are born under Libra or Gemini. Only under, so you've got to check somebody's birth sign before you um, decide whether to give them aspirin. Um, well, I mean, obviously, this is ridiculous. Probably you'll think this. I mean, if there's anybody here who believes in astrology, they probably don't think this is ridiculous. But if, for those of you who don't believe in astrology, this is obviously ridiculous. And the informative answer, even for those who are born under Libra or Gemini, is, those, is the result for any birth sign. And we sent it back. We put this as the first subgroup. And so we sent it back with lots of subgroup analyses, and this one up at the top. And um, Robin Fox said, well, hmm, well, all right, the paper's acceptable now, but you have to delete this astrology thing here because that's not serious. And we said, no, that is the only subgroup analysis that is serious. It's all the other ones that are not serious. <laughs> and so it finally came out with this one top of the list. Okay, now that is typical, except, and you can do it with any data set you want. Astrology is really reliable, 12 subgroups. If ever you want propaganda against, uh, you've got a big data set, you can always do it. It'll always be different astrological subgroups, of course. Um, but never mind. But it's okay. It's but it, it, it is bizarre. Um, okay, now I want to show a few particular results. Um, and the, the, my point here is that the meta-analyses of small trials often give wrong answers for reasons that I can't quite put my finger on. It isn't just that there are other things around. You don't sort it out just by funnel plots. You'd have to hypothesize hundreds of hidden trials, you know, really implausible numbers of hidden trials to explain it. And so very often I'm going to give several examples. Um, I'll start off with magnesium infusion. When you're having an acute heart attack, should you give an infusion of magnesium? There's animal models that say it should actually reduce the risk of various arrhythmias and deaths. There's, you know, there were human studies. 
And there was eventually a number of small trials were done, and a meta-analysis of them said, yes, this worked. But they were all small, and even the meta-analysis of the small ones only had about 1,500 patients in it. And then somebody did a slightly larger one with 1,200 patients. Well, you know, this, this would often be considered serious evidence. I mean, the result was three standard errors in favor of magnesium. Anyway, um, here's a summary. Nine small trials, top line here is nine small trials with 1,500 patients, 42 deaths versus 86 deaths. They're all evenly randomized, 42 versus 86. Look at it, wonderful. P less than 0.3 noughts one. Then there's the Leicester trial, which, you know, not significant, but still pretty promising. Put that together with the nine small trials, get 10, one medium, and nine small, and you've got 132 versus 190, about 200 and something. So a reduction of a third. And so we then did the ISIS-4 trial with 58,000 patients in and got this. And, you know, we got the, ras the aspirin the right way around. Everything was done properly. And, you know, while we were doing it, we got some very heavy breathing on. The data monitoring committee was being told, look, this is unethical. This is as unethical as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment observational study. You always get either Tuskegee or Mengele. I don't know why. Um, and... So we were told that what we were doing was unethical and, was and this guy was appealing to the data monitoring committee to stop the study. He was the one person who could actually halt this ethical monstrosity of taking something where the meta-analysis says it definitely works and then getting further evidence. This was just human sacrifice, except it doesn't work. So at the bottom, we got 2,300 versus 2,300 deaths when we put all the evidence together based on 62,000. And... You know, that was okay. To us, that said, it doesn't work. But if you do a random effects analysis on this, then it says still, because random effects models are really useless when you've got big differences in trial size because they give virtually no weight to the big trial. Um, um, it, the random effects model says that, um, yeah, magnesium works really well. It prevents a third of the deaths P, P less than 0 0.001. You try running it. It's quite an interesting exercise. Um, and here are the smaller trials, but also here, which wasn't here before, is another trial called MAGIC, magnesium something or other, in coronaries or something like that. Um, because they, the Americans just didn't believe this result. They knew we'd done it wrong somehow, and they were going to do it right. Now, they were quite aggressive about it, and so they then did their magnesium trial, and actually they got, what is it, 4,700, no, 475 versus 472 deaths. So just null. So now we've got, well, it's nearly, it's six, now we've got 69,000 randomized and no difference. But still, even with that trial, even with ISIS-4 and with MAGIC, feed these numbers on this graph into a random effects model and you'll finish up with a three standard error difference in favor of magnesium. And one reason we were told that we should stop the trial is that it didn't matter what the result was going to be in 58,000. A random effects meta-analysis would still say the treatment worked. Therefore, we couldn't change the results of the random effects meta-analysis. Therefore, we shouldn't be doing the trial. Actually, the moral is, therefore, we shouldn't be doing random effects meta-analyses. And it's, it's, it's because they just don't give due weight to big studies. Okay, so there's an example where the meta-analysis of small trials was contradicted by a big trial. Now I'll show one where the meta-analysis of small trials was reinforced. So clock busters in acute heart attack, meta-analysis of small trials confirmed by big trials. The small trials were done. They, if you looked at the meta-analysis, it looked good, but nobody was using it, so we did a big trial. And after that, people were using it. Now, it doesn't matter if you can't read this. It's the usual meta-analysis. There's the meta-analysis of small trials. There's the overall result. It was preventing about a quarter of deaths in hospital. And this time, the big trial supports that conclusion. So we randomized 17,000 patients, and it supported that conclusion. But the evidence here really isn't much different from the magnesium evidence, the prior evidence, except in this case it's true. In the magnesium case, it wasn't. But there were good plausible mechanisms in both cases. And then once the big trials came out in 1988, then suddenly within a year, there's a switch in treatment. So, but again, we were told that it was very difficult, that it was unethical to have done that trial. And also with the big trials, you could put all the trials together and you can get a graph of benefit versus time when you give the treatment. It's like the one um, recently done for stroke when clockbusters, you know, you've got to give the treatment quickly if you've got to get benefit.
And exactly when the cutoff is, is always going to be a bit, a bit fuzzy. Okay, so there's one meta-analysis supported, one refuted. And again, I put, I put this one up because I, had, I don't know if Ben, ben Goldacre's in the audience, but he's got this as an example of, of trialists being unethical. And since I'm the trialist that was unethical, I want Ben to actually defend himself. His book is 99% good, but 1% bad. I want to talk to him about the bad stuff. There's bad, bad pharmacy. Okay, vitamin A and child mortality. Now here, we've got a case where we've got a meta-analysis that was absolutely conclusive. Give vitamin A to young kids in poor countries and you prevent a quarter of all child mortality. We did a randomized trial with a million young kids and it didn't seem to make much difference. Put the two together and the effect is probably only about half as big as was being claimed before. So here we've got eight smaller trials. And although they're cluster randomized trials, you can work out what they're equivalent to in terms of number of deaths, 650 deaths versus 846. So 600 versus 800 deaths. And there, there it is. That's all eight small trials together. Our big trial with a million kids, it's equivalent to something like 1470 versus 1540, so a relative risk of 0.96. So this 23% this reduction is really contradicted by the big trial. And the big trial was done in a population where they've got vitamin A deficiency, they've got biochemical deficiency, they've got beta spots in their eyes, we've got child mortality from diseases of interest. You know, this is where it, sh it was said it would, and so if you put a more, if you take a weighted average of this and this, that's what you get. You get something only half as big. The treatment effect seems to be only half as big as it used to. And in vitamin A, you've got vitamin A enthusiasts who wrote us emails saying that the incompetence of our trial is going to cause 300,000 unnecessary child deaths a year by interfering with vitamin A supplementation. You've got these sort of anti-vitamin A brigade who think that it's a plot by Americans to poison their kids. And they condemn us for doing a meta-analysis of all the trials instead of accepting that we've proved it doesn't work. So, and we haven't got anybody who actually seems to like the meta-analysis that comes out. So we've got everybody as our enemy here. The pro and the anti-vitamin A seem to be un agreed to put us as their enemy, which seems a bit hard, really. Um, so, and again, here's the detail. And it's, you, I've, I've put the references as to where you can find these things. So there's, there's, the, there's the eight small trials. There's the sum of the eight small trials you've already seen. There's the big DEFTA trial, and there's the, there's the weighted average of all of them. Now, when I do a meta-analysis, I take a weighted average of the different trial results. I don't assume that the result is the same in each trial. It might or might not be. I don't assume the true result. I just take a weighted average of what's done. It doesn't assume that the result is the same in each trial. It doesn't make any assumptions. It's, it, it, it's, you know, it's been christened the fixed effect model, but it's a stupid name for it because it is not assuming a fixed effect. It is just taking a weighted average of the things that were done. The term fixed effect should be discontinued. It, you know, one should just, I think we just call them weighted averages. It would avoid muddle. Okay, so need to, for reliable assessment of moderate effects on mortality, trust the relative risks from the totality of all the evidence, not from bits of it. Now, this brings me back to some of the stuff on cholesterol. I'm bound to finish with cholesterol at some stage. Here we, we're going back to 1992. So here's the Guardian in 1992, the Daily Mail in 1992, and the BMJ in 1992. Guardian headline, murders linked to low-fat drugs. Yeah, because there was an excess of murdered People got murdered in the treatment group in one of the trials. Very good. Aggressive, suicidal, your healthy low cholesterol could be to blame. That's the Daily Mail. And the BMJ was saying, should there be a moratorium on the use of cholesterol-lowering drugs? Well, maybe they should on some of those old ones because they weren't very good. Then, fortunately, the statins were being introduced just about then. And statins really dropped cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, beautifully with very few side effects. Not zero side effects, but very few side effects. And so suddenly, we could actually do large-scale trials and we could actually get the evidence that was really needed on cholesterol. Cholesterol lowering is like blood pressure lowering. It's like stopping smoking. It really matters. And it really dominates. I mean, it's one of the things that really affects national death rates. So, but before the first statin trial came out, so you know, the statin trials were being done by different manufacturers with many, many billions of dollars at stake. And they're working with investigators. The investigators who are working on particular drugs want to keep in well with the manufacturers. And so they tend to be biased towards the manufacturers of the drug they're testing. And so it was quite difficult to get all of the different investigators to agree 
before the first result came out. So they all agreed early in 1994, before the first truck was, thing was unblinded, that they were going to share their data and they were going to keep on sharing their data in detail over the years and they'd all discuss the analyses and that whatever, you know, the, the, they could disagree about the interpretation of the analyses but the data would be made available and that's what they agreed. And with great difficulty that collaboration has hung together over the last 20 years and it's produced some quite nice results. Um, so, when, last time they looked, they've got 26 trials of statin versus nothing, actually versus placebo, most of them. They produce about a one millimole difference in, um, in LDL cholesterol, one millimole, you know, it might change an LDL of four down to an LDL of three, or an LDL of three down to an LDL of two. But 130,000 patients followed for five years, you know, more than 20,000 vascular events. And then there's been trials of more versus less statin. They produce only about half a millimole difference, but the protection per millimole was the same in these two trials. Five trials, 40,000 patients, again, five years follow up. Um, and so there's a lot of information, and it can be summarized in a, this is Rory Collins' funny little picture. Start off with control, then we'll, so we start off giving people nothing, then we give them a statin, what happens? The, if you get, a one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, which are sort of the early statin regimens could do. Modern statin regimen can probably get about a two millimole reduction, but the old ones didn't in the trials, partly because people didn't take their pills and we analyzed by allocated treatment. Anyway, nothing versus statin, 22% fewer major vascular events, heart attack, stroke, you know, artery blocked up, so you've got to revascularize it. Then more statin versus standard statin, another 15% reduction. And again, this is outcome by allocated treatment. If you actually take treatment, the effect is bigger. And also there are treatments around now which are out of patents which produce big effects. And so if you put these two together, then a reasonably strong regimen in the trials would have knocked about a third off the risk with one and a half millimoles. But in a lot of patients, you knock two millimoles off. And that suggests if one and a half knocks a third off, then two ought to knock about 40% of vascular mortality, it seems it does, and does so fairly safely. Now, whether it should be used, you know, we don't say it should be used. I mean, when we study smoking and stop, we say half of all smokers get killed by it, stopping smoking works, but we don't tell people whether they should stop. We get the evidence out, stop smoking kills, stopping works, then other people can determine what the law should be, who stop, whether people stop, what restrictions of advertising get done, we get the numbers straight. And that's the thing in the statin, get the numbers straight on the main effects, get the numbers straight on the side effects, but that's not the same as what should the guidelines be. We want the data to be straight, and I'm afraid that the statin wars debate at lunchtime is going to mix these two questions up. The problem at the moment is that the data is not clearly available on side effects because it's been misrepresented and muddled up. And it's that we want the data to be available. Okay, um, and then you can classify them. I'm very nearly at the end for you. Sorry, I, I, I'm the last person who wanted to stop a question on this topic, um, but we've, we've come to 9.30. Could you, if I give you another five minutes, would you take that? Oh, do it in less than five minutes. Okay, sure. And you can ask the first question. No. <laughs> um, okay, so if you split these, these results up and say, how does the reduction per millimole um, depend on the risk that you start off with. Well, this is what your risk of having a major vascular event in five years. So, um, you know, this lot here, less than 5%, then 5 to 10% here. And actually, if anything, in the very low risk, the proportional benefit is greater. So at least the upper confidence limits are all about the same. And although, of course, the absolute benefit's going to be less. If your absolute risk's lower, then knocking a third off your absolute risk is going to do less um, later on. So anyway, it, the, and the best guide as to what you're going to do in any category of patients is the proportional risk reduction that you see overall. And not what you see if you look just at the number of deaths in the low-risk lot. If you want to know what this is doing to vascular mortality in the low-risk lot, don't just look at the deaths in the low-risk lot. Take the totality of the evidence, get the relative risk from that, then apply it to the low risk loss, and that applies also to a lot of breast cancer stuff. If you want to know about the side effects, then it's, it's no use just saying, if I give the patient statins, do they say it's making them feel ill? 
because if you give them anything and say, does it produce this, does it produce that, you know, then you're going to get people saying, yes, it does. Now, in these trials, every six months they'd ask them, do you have muscle pain? And every six months, 6% 6 of the people in both groups would say yes. So by the end of the trial, you've got about 30% who said, yes, it's caused muscle pain. But it's 30% placebo, 30% um, statin. There was almost no difference. There was a small but real difference in real myopathy, the actual mechanisms of which, but it's about one per 10,000 per year. Rhabdomyolysis, about one per 100,000 per year. Zero difference in cataract, zero difference in memory loss. There is an increase in diabetes, um, small increase in um, body weight and in diabetes, peripatsy with that. But these side effects, you can get them from the placebo-controlled comparisons, but you cannot get them from non-placebo-controlled comparisons. And there's muddle between these two. So on interpretation of randomized evidence, the statin wars issue is not whether to treat. I don't want to express an opinion on whether to treat low-risk people, whether to treat high-risk people. The problem on the statin wars is whether to accept non-placebo-controlled evidence of vague side effects, and you just can't do it. I mean, every drug is going to, be, is going to have side effects if you try and do that. We've got placebo-controlled evidence on over 100,000. Let's use that. It's unbiased. And if we do that, then the statin wars can end. I've got no, no opinion on... OK, so just a summary. Part of, OK, we pass the cholesterol now. Um, for reliable assessment of moderate effects on mortality, we need large-scale large, large scale randomised evidence. We need common sense. We need to be guided by the overall relative risks. The main enemy of common sense is over-optimism. With few exceptions, claims of vast gains from new drugs are evanescent. I wanted to say prove evanescent, but it went over the line. Um, and if doctors start off with a sort of healthy scepticism about the many apparently striking claims in the medical literature, big trials do make medical sense. I mean, the rough rule, look, there's a thing called Bayesian inference, and it basically means if it looks too good to be true, then it probably is. But now, this may look like a program for just boring, you know, a lifetime of completely boring drudgery, but actually, yes, it is. Actually, yes, it is. <laughs> but... When you look back on your lifetime of boring drudgery, sometimes you see some nice things. And one really nice thing is breast cancer, because in breast cancer, it's not changing for any reason except early diagnosis and better treatment. And we found lots and lots of small gains, a small gain from radiotherapy, a small gain from the early endocrine regimens, more when you give tamoxifen for five years, now more when you give an aromatase inhibitor more when you give crummy old chemotherapy, more when you give slightly better chemotherapy. You know, just one thing after another after another, and they're all small and boring. But look at it. There's, there's the national death rates. They've gone down by half. Instead of 2.8% of the women in this country dying from breast cancer in middle age, 1.4% do. And that's because all those boring things add together. So, you know, if you keep on being boring long enough, then you finish up getting interesting. And so that's, that's, that's my conclusion. OK, so, so it is fun, after all, at the end of your life. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think we can leave Richard without asking a couple of questions. Um, although we're running over time, which is, I'm sure, my fault, can we um, have some microphones and just two hands up or lots of, see, lots of people want to ask a question. We're are there, there. Are there microphones? <laughs> Um, brilliant. Just raise your hands loud and hit. There's one there, and a second question there. So those are our two, sir. Could you say who you are? There's a microphone coming your way. Uh, Kit Bayer from Hereford. Um, as far as statins are concerned, is a randomised uh, controlled trial uh, without a, an open label run-in the same as a randomised controlled trial with an open label run-in? Well. Well, the running doesn't make much difference. I mean, the trouble with trials is that um, a lot of people do say they'll join a study and then they'll just drop out in the first week or two. So, you know, if, if you're doing... Um, if you, sorry, if people don't know, a run-in period at a trial is where you give everybody the same treatment. It can either be a dummy pill. Some trials have a dummy run-in period or they might have an active run-in period. It doesn't matter which they do. 
and, and the aim is to get rid of the people who would just drop out anyway and wouldn't actually take their pills for five years. I mean, obviously, those trials are acute heart attack. You don't do a run-in period. You just treat. But if you want to keep people on pills for five years, it's a fairly unusual person who's going to volunteer for a study like that and then keep to it and think, oh, and not just throw it away. So you want to find the ones who are just not going to take the pills and then not randomise them. So that's what the run-in period is for. And, it doesn't, and then you start your trial with the people who've actually who at the end of the run-in period think that they're still going to keep going for the next five years. So it's, it's basically more looking for willingness than for looking for something else. You can sometimes get some information from the run-in period, like how, how if you give it on active, you can say how responsive do they seem to be to the treatment of interest. You could exclude people who seem to have some kind of allergic reaction to the treatment of interest. Um, and so you'd miss out the people who wouldn't be able to take the treatment for that reason. But they don't, they don't really change... And, it, and the running period could be open. It doesn't matter. You, 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 but you know, when the trial goes on, from the moment of randomization, then everybody's in. The aim of a randomized trial is not to get a sort of representative sample of all patients. The patients in trials are always seriously atypical. They're atypical in many ways. It's just that the two groups allocated A and B are comparable because they start off randomized. Do we have good evidence that patients who get side effects on it tablet don't drop out more frequently than those who don't, because that's a systematic potential cause of bias, which you've just been telling No, 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 it's not a cause of bias at all. Um, it, it's bias, it, once you've randomised, everybody's in. So you, you've, got, you've got people, the main thing you're trying to do is get rid of people who answer the trial who wouldn't actually take the pills, but it, you've got an unbiased comparison once you start. You might have patients who are likely to get side effects underrepresented. I mean, it's... Open run-in before randomisation, I'm concerned. Sorry? Open label run-in before randomisation, I'm concerned about. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you might find people who would... Either who would get side effects or who would imagine they've got side effects. Either way, you don't want them. You want people who will actually take the pills and then you find out what the pills do if taken and you extrapolate from that to what they would do if taken in other circumstances. Question here. Uh, is this yeah, Rod Jackson? Rod Jackson, New Zealand. Uh, Richard, I just wanted to raise a, uh, an area where randomised controlled trials, an important area, probably cause more heat than light. And Sorry, which trials have caused more heat than light? Uh, dietary saturated fat. Oh yeah. Coronary disease, because in fact you can't do these trials. Yeah, it's very difficult to actually randomise and get good compliance. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, so th this is the trial, you know, do, so we'd, we'd like people to change their diet and modify their lipids like that, but when you actually try to randomise people to do one diet or another diet, very, very soon they just, it's like the, the randomised trials are getting people to lose weight, it's just extremely difficult to actually maintain weight loss long term, long term or even long enough to do a trial. Um, and this caused a lot of the chaos before statins were invented, because it's very difficult to randomise people to two very, very different diets and really keep them to that for a substantial fraction of the human lifespan. Um, and, it, and, it, and it produced a lot of false negatives. And then the non-heart attack deaths, by chance, went the wrong way in those old diet trials. And hence all these headlines about murder, aggression. And, oh, there's a lot about cancer as well, which, again, just disappeared when you got serious evidence on big numbers. The relative risk for cancer in the statin trials based on huge numbers, is 1.00, absolutely identical in the statin and the non-statin. You know, cholesterol lowering does not cause cancer. Um, and although cancer does cause cholesterol lowering, you know, because you, you become cachexic. So the, the, the diet trials, they, they, were, they were hopeless as machines for answers. It's, it's like Jeffrey Rose went and did a randomised trial of the effects of stopping smoking. Well, I'll tell you what, if I'd been running a tobacco company back in the 1960s, I'd have paid him to do it because he's bound to produce an informative result. And so for decades afterwards, the tobacco company was saying, look, but when you randomise, you don't see any effect. Well, no, you didn't see much effect on the number of heavy smokers who kept on smoking. That was a problem. So it's, you, you, trials, you've got to have... Uh, the nice thing about pills is they're easily testable, much more easily testable than lifestyle changes. doesn't mean that lifestyle changes aren't more important, but it's very, very difficult to randomise smoking cessation. In fact, you can't really... Um, and to looking for um, mortality outcomes because you just won't get good enough compliance. 
I don't know anything else, Fiona. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity. Richard, thank you so much. That was really fantastic.